Hi, and welcome to this lecture on Indigenous and Polynesian Sciences. Now, I don't know about you, but the amount of information that I got about Indigenous cultures within my primary and secondary schooling was um, quite scant, to, uh, to put it mildly. So uh, that's definitely changed in modern times. So there's a much greater emphasis on bringing the sciences of other cultures and also histories, um, cultures and their, their sciences into the curriculum. So the purpose of this lecture is to make some small steps towards that end. Okay? So just like every other lecture, um, these are our learning objectives. So we are going to be looking at, now I won't read them out like I have in previous lectures. You can pause and do that yourself. Um, so what we're going to do is have a look at so the ind indigenous sciences, but also Polynesian sciences as well. Um, and this way you can actually bring a whole heap of really interesting material into your teaching. Now, not just if you're teaching Indone um, indigenous and Polynesian kids, but also just, just the wider population, because um, this is our small way in the sciences of bridging that cultural understanding and bringing people of different cultures together. So we're going to have a look at the sciences. So remember from lecture one how we were looking at uh, the definition of science as being knowledge verified in a particular way. Well, this particular knowledge, it wasn't verified and discovered through the means of an experiment like um, Western methods. These, this is knowledge and, and, and the, the scientific knowledge of, of, of two broadish cultures of indigenous and Polynesian. Um, the, the knowledge that they generated over time and verified in a different way, but it's still knowledge which served these two groups um, in really, really powerful ways and saw them thrive. Okay? So that's what we're going to have a look at in terms of this lecture. Now, if, 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 like, your, if, if like myself, um, you didn't learn much about Indigenous histories coming through the schooling system, then here are some great resources that you can read in your holidays to bring yourself up to speed. Now, Bill Gamage uh, wrote that book, The Biggest State on Earth. He's a, a, a history professor from ANU, probably one of the best books on this topic that I've ever read. Um, Bruce Pascoe is an indigenous gentleman and he wrote Dark Emu. Um, those are, both those books are, are in ebook format um, and you can buy them in electronic form, but I'm pretty sure they might be in the library. Now, one that's definitely in the library is that, that documentary series there, First Footprint. So if you search our library catalogue, you'll find that four-part, five-part documentary series, excellent. Um, Professor Paul Tacon from um, Upstairs, an archaeologist, he features in that documentary. And it's another great way of immersing yourself, bringing yourself up to speed in terms of indigenous cultures. Now, in terms of the epistemology um, and, and ontology of indigenous cultures and, and how information was stored in pre-literate societies, um, Lynn Kelly's book, The Memory Code, goes into that in great t detail. And so she draws upon some great examples of how indigenous cultures from around the world encoded and stored important information before they had developed writing that ensured that those people were able to survive for thousands of years. So great books for you to dive into. Now, one of the reasons of why we are incorporating Indigenous and Polynesian sciences into the science classroom is because of this priority. So remember the cross-curriculum priorities are three areas that, that the Australian government through ACARA have deemed to be really, really important topics that they would like to be immersed and infused into all curricula, regardless of what you teach. So, so remember, they are Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures. They are engagement with Southeast Asia and also sustainability. Sustainability is pretty easy for us in the sciences. Um, but a lot of people, because of um, negative attitudes towards Indigenous people in Australia tend not to really think that Indigenous uh, knowledges in the sciences are, are valid enough for us to actually talk about in the science classroom. 
I strongly disagree with that, and so does Ikara. So originally when the syllabuses, or the, sorry, the curricula actually came out, um, it was in there, but people were really struggling with how to build Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history and cultures into sciences. So for us, it's not really about history and their cultures. For us, it's really about the sciences. So to this end, in 2018, a committee were put together by ACARA to actually sit down and look at all the content descriptors in science, the science understanding content descriptors, and actually develop um, elaborations from an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspective. And so there's a link there that you can actually go to and download that document. So you will be, you'll be aware that the Australian curriculum is full of our elaborations. They've now added a second element to that by providing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elaborations for every single object um, uh, content descriptor, which is an amazing um, 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 task that they undertook to actually do that. So they are so just like all elaborations, they are starting positions. They are not the end point. If you are teaching in a school which has close connections with the local people and you can think of another way to actually address the content descriptor from another perspective, you're more than welcome to do so. Remember that elaborations are serving suggestions only. So in terms of who out there are actually teaching Indigenous science, well, the CSIRO, another branch of the government, is actually well and truly um, heading down this track. Obviously, um, schools who have much closer ties to their local indigenous communities are, are really heading down this track. But you can see there, there's um, um, Arionga, which is a school, I think it's 200 kilometers um, outside of, of Alice Springs, so, so really quite remote. Um, they've picked up a CSIRO Science Award for, for teaching um, Indigenous sciences in the classroom. So, so it's not really just for Indigenous kids, this is really for everybody because it can really bring to life some of the more boring concepts that we've got to deal with in the sciences, really bring that to life. Okay, okay. So there were two resources. Okay. Let's get started. Now before we get started, one of, because we're delving into the past, it's really hard for us to get a good grasp of just the magnitude of time. Um, even a thousand years, 2,000, 10,000, 100,000, million years, is really, really hard for us to wrap our head around. So what we do when we teach science is that we use a lot of models and or metaphors to get across these really, these mind-blowing kind of concepts that we're dealing with. One of those is deep time. And what I mean by deep time is like long stretches of time. So for example, the existence of the universe, formation of our solar system, even the formation of the earth would actually fall within this area of really difficult thing concepts to understand. Okay? Now, so what this activity here does is it helps us put into perspective just how, how long the earth has actually existed and and that in relation to how long we as humans have actually been on Earth. So you can actually, so let's do this as a predict, observe, explain, okay? So the prediction I'd like you to make is to predict that if we were to jump in a car and drive from, say, Perth to Sydney, okay, so that's across Australia, yeah, pretty much, okay? How, at what distance would, the, would uh, we see humans? Okay, so we're driving along, Yep, so Earth is born, driving along, driving along. At what point in that timeline would we see humans appear? So halfway, yeah, within the first 10 k's of the trip, um, a kilometre from Sydney. What I'd like you to do is to pause and have a think about that question. Okay, so all up is roughly 3,940 kilometres, that distance. Have a good think about when along that 3,000, uh, nearly 4,000 kilometers, when humans would first appear. So I'm gonna show you this video and I'm gonna talk it through. Um, if it will let me. No, it's not gonna let me. Okay, so let's do it this way. Right. Um, it's still not showing. Oh, here we go. Okay, 
So I'll just expand this and I'll talk it through. Okay, so that's the entire distance that we're talking about there. Now, one way that you can approach this is take kids out onto an oval, but the distances get really squished. So this is a much better example. So there, you can see four and a half billion years ago, the moon was born. That's because this great big thing slammed into the Earth and it, the ejector went out into space, formed the Earth. Fast forward to 3.8 million years ago, um, we get life up here, yeah? So the, the seven characteristics of life, we observe that for the first time. Photosynthesis come around 3.4 billion years ago, that distance, okay? So seeing here, we're about halfway-ish, yeah? The cyanobacteria, the, the ones um, who are able to produce oxygen, monkey Mia, the stromatolites, um, they're born. Now, however, fast forward again, they produce so much oxygen, they kill everything. 600 million years ago, the mul first multicellular, us, we, um, sorry, multicellulars, I mean. Um, plants finally make it onto land, 465 million years ago. Sharks are older than this. The amphibians, the salamanders, the uh, frogs, toads, they appear. Now we're down to 135 kilometres and we've got the first um, extinction. Now, this was a great big extinction. Nearly all life got wiped out. 240 million years ago, the first dinosaurs arrive, um, appear. So that's 240 million years ago. They arrive, let's say, around quite a long time. Pangaea breaks up two continents, Eurasia, um, Laurasia, sorry, and Gondwana in the south. 67 million years ago, nearly time for that asteroid to arrive, Tyrannosaurus rex. Uh, appears. Fast forward to million uh, years later, we get the KPG boundary. So that's that big dinosaur, 66, 65,000 years ago. So our branch start to really flourish. So dinosaurs no longer around, we start to pick up. We're three miles out, our first cousins start to appear six million years ago. Now we're now down to 1.6 kilometers away. Whoa, okay. Um, so, um, we start to develop tools, Homo habilis. The first modern humans appear, 570 feet, convert that to metric, you can use Siri. Fast forward again, the agricultural revolution begins, okay, 28, uh, 28 28.5 feet away, nearly there, okay, so 15 feet from our final destination, we start writing stuff down. That's really fascinating, 2,000 years ago. Um, JC appeared 5.6 feet from our destination, and we're nearly there. 1940, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Um, nearly there, 8.2 inches, United States. So what's that, 300, 400 years ago? Oh, 239 years ago. Uh, 75 years ago, okay? Here we are. So, the point of this exercise is to show just how crazy big time actually is and how big um, geologic time is in relation to how long humans have been around. Okie dokie. So let's go back. How did you go with your prediction? We've just done the explanation. Now it's your turn to come up with the explanation. Okay. So let's have a look at, so we're narrowing down, narrowing down. So that's humans as a life as a whole, the, the, human pl the, the planet as a whole. Let's have a look now at the human story in particular, okay? So if we look at humans in particular, we started in that red region. As far as the evidence tells us, our best guess tells us we, our species, modern humans, started somewhere in East Africa, probably around the rift region of Ethiopia. From there, we spread out across the, um, the globe. So. We've got here, so started out here in the red, 100,000 years ago, we finally moved into the Fertile Crescent. This is modern humans, by the way, into the Fertile Crescent, move over here into India and Asia by 70,000 70, years ago, and plus or minus 10,000 years, humans arrived in Australia. Now, forget this branch, because that's actually not so correct, but here we've got, so from Asia, we spread out over into uh, Mongolia and Russia, we crossed the Bering Bridge when sea levels were much lower because um, yeah, stuff happened, climate change, that got cut off. And so finally we had entered around, by around about 15,000 years ago 
into Alaska up here, down through North America, down, 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 all the way through to South America. Okay, now that's an interesting element over here because you'll notice that that arriving in Madagascar only happened 1,500 years ago and that's roughly about the time humans made it to uh, New Zealand, which was one of the last places on Earth for humans to colonise. Forget that 30,000 years, not correct. Okay, so let's, let's, let's focus in, in again. So let's have a look at the Indigenous Australians and also the Polynesians, where their ancestors came from. Okay, so we've got here down through the Southeast Asia archipelagos, um, there was a lot of, there was some island hopping along the way, eventually arriving in the Australian mainland about 50,000 years ago. Now, this map actually is a more of a modern map because if we showed Australia back then, uh, Tasmania would have actually still been connected to the mainland. And also the coastline would have been vastly different to this. Okay? When we have a look at the Polynesian, the, the path that they took, now, they came, most likely, they came down through Taiwan, um, down through the Philippines, island hopping, island hopping, down up here, the Marshall Islands, the Marquesas, um, through uh, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea. So they stopped e around here, Fiji, Samoa, 1,500 years ago, then spread out over here to the Marquesas, then up to Hawaii, down to Easter Island, and over down into uh, New Zealand. Okay? So it's a fascinating um, trip um, how two groups moved from Africa into, um, into Asia, down through Southeast Asia, and out into lands which are pretty much around the Pacific. Okay? How did the Polynesians manage this? At a time when um, navigation in Europe um, in Africa and other parts of the world were very much about hugging coastlines. Just how did the Polynesians manage these open ocean uh, crossings? Okay. The answer to that is um, in this video here. So we won't watch the video like we did with the last one, but that's going to be a task that I'm going to ask you to do. So just like every other video that I'm going to ask you to watch, if you download the PowerPoint from the Teams site, you'll be able to, uh, the links will be active once you press the present, go into presentation mode. So watch that clip, it's a TED Ed video. Um, excellent, um, um, excellent production values, great information, up-to-date information, so go ahead. So from this text, I would like you to list the sciences that the Polynesians used to get out to pretty much the middle of nowhere. Easter Island is, is in uh, Polynesian language, um, pitu e honua, which means the belly button of the earth. And if you look at a globe, it, it quite literally is the belly button of the earth and like just out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but the Polynesians were able to get there and they, they just didn't stumble across it because if you're going to attempt these open ocean journeys, you can't just point your boat in one, you know, in, out to sea and, uh, and then hope that you hit land, um, that's just not going to work. That is pretty much guaranteed death. Um, so how did they do it? Watch that video and find out. Okay? So other technologies that they would have had to develop um, is, for example, boat building. Now, the Polynesian word boat, uh, vaka, is sometimes translated to canoe. And I think that does that technology some real disservice because when we think canoe, we think a single hull, um, kind of a long thing that's really not built for open ocean journeying. When Polynesians use the word vaka, um, they actually mean a legit boat. So here's one here with a platform. This is probably more of a ceremonial boat where some high chieftain um, would, would be sitting up here on the platform and people would be down here rowing. So they would use this boat as a ceremonial, kind of a, a day tripping boat, just around lagoons, very, very close to islands. When, however, it was time to actually journey to another island beyond the horizon, they would use these double hull canoes because they were much more stable and also have these um, uh, crab claw shaped 
uh, sails, which are quite characteristic of Pol uh, Polynesian Baka. So boat building is quite a, uh, a, an intricate craft and you can't just knock up a boat. Um, you need to be trained over years to be able to do it. There's all kind of techniques that you need to be able to build these boats. One of the ways that they actually navigated was by um, using maps like this. Now, so we've got the traditional cardinal directions of north, south, uh, south, east and west. But in terms of navigation, rather than using constellations, which are essentially um, mental uh, groups of stars that we just draw lines between just to help us remember them, rather than using groups of stars for navigation, individual stars were used for that purpose. So for example, you would set, if you were headed over to say BG, you would know at a certain time of year that a particular star rising over in the west would actually signal the way for you to go. Now, it wasn't just navigation by star because it was quite a complex um, system of knowledge where you combined astronomical and celestial navigation with local ocean, your knowledge of local ocean currents and also animal, animal behaviour. So birds, for example, you would know which birds needed to stay close to land, which birds migrated um, long, long distances. You would understand the behaviour of some of the more big mammals in the ocean, such as whales and dolphins. Um, you would understand sharks and in terms of those sharks which are out in open water, those sharks that would have to stay close to reefs. You would understand all of that and use a sophisticated understanding of all those little bits of knowledge interconnected in a way so that you can actually navigate from island to island. So in aid of that purpose, maps were developed. So remember, Polynesians and also Indigenous Australians, they didn't have systems of writing. So every single bit of knowledge actually had to be memorised because there was no books for you to write. There was no lang uh, written language for you to use. So in terms of memorising information, these Polynesian shell maps were one of the ways that navigators used to teach trainee navigators coming through the ranks how to identify islands. So islands were represented as shells, but also those islands in relation to prevailing ocean currents which ways that if waves hit a particular island, how would they bend and, and refract out to sea so that you can actually identify, oh, I'm at this particular island. Okay. Now, a lot of times we focus a lot on the actual you know, mechanics of, uh, of journeying when we look at these uh, technologies of past cultures. But um, the, for you to survive open ocean journeys, you need to have quite a sophisticated understanding of food and also um, the longevity of that food. Um, you could only take foods which would actually last well or, or if you were taking animals and they had to, you know, you had to be able to look after them in open ocean settings. So when we look at the archaeological evidence of the first Polynesians, as they move from island to island, we find that they tend to take with them key animals. So some of those are the chicken and the rat. So the chicken evolved from a jungle fowl, which was found in Southeast Asia. It was domesticated there, nice and compact. It doesn't like flying away. Great for open ocean journeys where there's not a lot of space. Rats were also convenient, had a very, very high reproductive rate, were small in size. Um, you know, a, a single rat was a nice meal and so forth. Then you had tuberous food. So taro was a, was a great food because it stored well. Um, um, uh, uh, kumara, um, sweet potato, is an interesting uh, vegetable because it's actually native to South America. And the reason why the latest archaeological evidence that we understand is that um, early po uh, Polynesian explorers made it all the way over to South America had a good time with the locals. It's like, hey, what's this uh, food that you've got here? Picked it up and actually brought it back and then spread it all the way throughout the Pacific. Bananas store well, um, pigs are, are good travel companions as well. So there was actually a travel kit 
that the Polynesians took with them. So just like astronauts need to take everything with them up into outer space, they don't take, take live animals because we have different technology where we can process food, add preservatives, we can package it, vacuum pack it, you know, dehydrate it. We have technology now which allows us to prepare food for those long-term journeys um, into outer space. Well, it was the same thing with the Polynesians. They had to take their own food with them and they solved that through their technologies of animal husbandry and also good understanding of the types of foods which would last long. Okay, And also the coconut, yeah? Um, and, and a common practice back in, back in the day was that when uh, they would arrive on a new set of islands, they, if, if there weren't already coconuts there, they would actually deliberately plant coconuts for future visitors to that island. So when they arrived, they had a source of drinking water and an also a source of uh, uh, um, uh, re really good fats and, and carbohydrates. Okay? So staying with that theme of the, the Polynesian explorers, one of, one of the, the, um, the, the mythical uh, personalities of, of Polynesia and known all the way throughout Polynesia actually from New Zealand to Hawaii they're, they're two islands at the opposite ends of the Polynesian Triangle um, through Tonga as well, Samoa, anywhere that Polynesians are Maui is a key figure. Um, so if you have a look at the work um, at, at the uh, movie Moana which means um, deep blue ocean in, 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 in Tongan Maui sings a song, and so here are the lyrics to that song. It's a pretty cool song. Um, and what I've done there is I've actually highlighted in red all of the elements in the song which are actually drawn from the myths and tales of the adventures of Maui, okay? So Maui, this demigod, um, was, um, we, we attribute to him separating um, the, the sky and the land. Uh, for creating the tides, for, um, for, for, um, for planting or well actually bringing into life the first coconut tree. So there's a whole range of things that have been attributed to Maui. Now the, the point of this is not to say, oh this is science, but to show you the way that information was coded in pre-literate societies. Okay? So this is not about, this is science, Maui made the coconut tree. This part is about in pre-literate cultures, information was passed down through the arts. Information was passed down through do uh, song, through dance, and through story. Song, dance, and story. Actually, you, you could probably say that song and dance are a type of story. Um, but this, that's the way that information was encoded. And, and you can see that illustrated quite well here. Now, it's also interesting to know that there's also an astrological link to uh, Maui in that the fish hook or Scorpio. So if you're a scorpion, oopsie, I can't navigate to this. Yeah, the star sign uh, constellation of Scorpio is actually uh, Maui's hook. So storytellers in New Zealand would say that, um, you know, tell the grandkids that how Maui pulled the islands of New Zealand out of the ocean using that hook and at certain times of the year, the Scorpio constellation actually dips, be, um, well actually, of course it, it actually um, dips below the, the eastern horizon, but as it rises, it looks like it's actually hooked land and actually pulling it out of the water. So it's kind of a nice storytelling device that, um, that, that a, a grandmother would have sitting around a campfire with, with her uh, young, young um, grandchildren. So, if, if you're interested in knowing more about Polynesian culture and the various stories that they have, then this is a nice uh, summary of all of the things which have been attributed to Maui. Now, there's, uh, there's discussion in um, archaeological groups that Maui was once upon, upon a time a real-life person, and he was actually a renowned navigator. And the reason why he is so well-known on all of these far-flung islands, because being a navigator and being a great navigator, um, he was able to travel to them all, and over time, his reputation got um, built upon and built upon and embellished here and there, and finally he ended up as a demigod. Um, but yeah, you can see, uh, have a read of that graphic and, and find out. You, you can find out more information 
about the legends of Maui. Okay, radio. So that's enough Polynesian signs. What you've done is you've watched that video before um, that uh, I, I directed you to earlier, and you've now listed the uh, technologies which Polynesians used to pretty much populate um, the, the, the Pacific. Yeah? So let's turn our attention now to indigenous, so Australian, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. So again, in terms of getting a good sense of the, these big uh, units of time that we're talking about, even though it is 50,000 years, like it, that number just rolls off, off, off the tongue so easily, um, it still does boggle the mind in terms of how that 50,000 years relates to the, the 2,000 years of, of European settlement in Australia. So to that end, um, here we go. Here's a challenge. Here's another predictive observe explained. So if we imagine that on a seven metre timeline, yeah, so you might want to pace it out. So if you pace out seven steps, yep, from start to finish, what, I, the, what I'd like you to do is predict on that seven metres, whereabouts the First Nations people arrive, so Indigenous Australians, when did they arrive on that seven metres? And when did the British arrive? Okay, so, okay, so, so on that seven metres, okay, so if you have a lecture as part of your course, I will actually, I've constructed this timeline. Um, yeah, and so make a prediction about where on that timeline did the Brits first arrive. Okie dokie. Okay, radio. Now, when we look at the knowledge systems we're of Indigenous people, we compare that to our knowledge systems in the West. So really we're talking about epistemology and, how we th and ontology of how we think of knowledge and how we think of reality. Epistemology and ontology are very much related. Okay? So what I'm going to ask you to do is, again, pause this video. This is your source for the Indigenous perspective of seasons. Okay? So watch this video, take notes, because eventually you're going to, going to compare and contrast the Western conception and the Indigenous conception. Now, we're going to dig deep, deeper into this, into a lab in your course, where we get the seasonal calendars from another, a number of indigenous nations around Australia. We're going to analyze those and compare and contrast. So you, you're actually starting that work here and we're going to dig much, much deeper in the lab when we have a look at the actual seasons, okay? But here we're really just, you know, working on quite a superficial level before we dig, dig much deeper in um, the labs, okay? So the, here is the indigenous perspective and here is a one of the Western European, Western slash European um, conceptions of seasons. Now, this is one of my, my favorite uh, pieces of, of music. So this was written, so the, it's a four part piece written by Vivaldi and it's called The Four Seasons. So each um, section is devoted to a season. Each season has three movements. Now, there was actually text accompanying the written music and there are some YouTube clips which actually um, have visuals in the background. So you're meant to actually read the text while you're listening to the music in, in its original conception. And if you do that, it's really quite cool because you can actually hear the birds singing. You can actually hear the thunderstorms. You can hear the murmuring streams. That's the cello part in the um, opening section in of springs. Um, so it's a really cool way of actually encoding information. So um, where we spoke earlier I have about how pre-literate societies encoded really, really important information in stories and song and dance. Well, Vivaldi continued that tradition in a small way in the construction of, of this piece and it's just beautiful because it, it takes those ideas and those words and it translates those into musical form and you can actually hear those themes. So in terms of compare and contrast, here is the thinking tool. So if you haven't already, watch the two videos previously and use the Venn diagram or a double bubble to actually look at similarities and differences between the conceptions of seasons. Okay? Now another really important technology that the indigenous people had 
was this thing of song lines. Now, wayfinding or navigating in uh, for the Polynesians involved a whole heap of knowledge of animals and currents and climate and weather and, and wind and, and how to read clouds and uh, like a whole heap of complex information which was brought together to be able to, for you to be able to go from one island to another island beyond the horizon, which is quite a difficult task. Well, it's the same thing in Australia, where if you are, say, um, down here on the Gold Coast, and it's time for you to head up to the Bunya Mountains, because the Bunya harvest is on and the festival is on, you need a way to get up there. Now, remember this is in a time before writing, before street signs, before, you know, um, uh, street lights and all the rest of it and GPS and Siri and, and Google Maps. Um, so information for you to get from one place in Australia to another, that information was encoded in what are called song lines. So these are essentially songs that you sing and then as you move along the path, you get to say from the Gold Coast up to Mount Gravatt, you would actually be singing songs, you would arrive in certain destinations and then you'd perform certain dances. You would recite songs and you would dance and you'd perform ceremony. And then through that singing and dancing and performance, it actually brings forth the rest of the map for you to, to journey on, okay? So for example, what you can see there, oh, there are two great videos uh, right over there uh, for you to actually check out. So one is just about what song lines are and that 360 experience um, by Rhoda Roberts is just awesome. So do watch that on your smart device because at various points you'll be required to turn so you can interact with the different elements within that video. Just brilliant. Okay. So, uh, so for example, um, Robert Fuller he investigated the song lines of the indigenous people from a town called Guduga. Guduga is is a town on the border of, whoopsie, is on the border of New South Wales and Queensland, just down there. Now, there are two pathways that you can take. So for example, you can go all the way from Guduga, go up here, hit Surat. Now you can either keep going straight up north, up here to Carnarvon Gore, which is another important meeting place, or you can hit Sur Surat and then hang a right and head over up here to Bunya Mountains. Okay. Now those two particular song lines are actually encoded in the stars. So you can imagine each night as a, a travelling group would actually arrive in a new place, they'd make camp and they'd just verify where they were, are by looking up at the stars and going, oh, look, that's where we are. Okay. So this map over here, all these, these particular stars, so these are the stars of the constellation of Scorpio. So Maui's old constellation, and then it moves into, um, oh no, it travels all the way along Sco uh, Scorpio, okay? So you can see how the modern towns of Gaduga and, I, Dur is that Durabandi? I can't read that, St. George, Surat. Now these were old indigenous towns that, and, and, and they were marked by the particular stars. So see the towns along here, they were represented by particular stars of the modern constellation of Scorpio. So by the time you got up here, you had reached your destination, that corresponds, that star corresponds to Narvan Gorge up here. However, if it was time for a Bunya festival, you're out here, you'd read the seasons, like, oh, it's time for Bunya harvest, or somebody would have arrived and reminded, the group is like, hey, come on over for a, for a bit of a feed. So you'd hit Surat, and instead of heading up the spine of Scorpio, it actually head over and follow stars along the western constellation of Ara. Um, so that's A-R-A, -A, Ara, um, and its stars are over here. So Surat would correspond to this particular star, Theta, Theta Scorpio, and then you'd follow the stars of uh, these stars, and that would actually get you through to the Bunya Mountains. Okay, So you can see here, that yes, we call them song lines because there are songs that you would sing as you encamp at each of these places, a ceremony for you, you to perform. There's the, um, the, the local people 
for you to actually talk to and must communicate with as you're tra uh, passing through their lands. Um, so, so not only is that encoded in the songs, but it is also reinforced by the, the stars in the sky. Okay? So it's a way of building redundancy into the knowledge system that if the stars weren't there, then you have the song. And if the song wasn't there, then you have the stars. But having the stars and the song allows you to verify your position on your path. Okay? So fascinating, fascinating piece of technology, um, the, the song lines. Yeah? Okay, so let's have a look at um, the migration of Indigenous Australians into Australia. So around about 50,000 years. Now there is a margin of, of error on that and that margin of error because of the nature of science is getting narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower. Okay, and eventually, you know, so once upon a time it was plus or minus 15,000 years, we're getting a 10,000 years. Over time we're getting more and more specific. Okay? So way, way, way back when, 50,000 years ago, the continent um, of Australia actually looked like this. So, the, so you got the lines, so modern Papua New Guinea was actually connected to mainland Australia, was actually connected to uh, Tasmania. So the, the path, as, as far as we can tell, was down through here. So the, uh, the sea levels were much, much lower. The distances between islands was much, much smaller and you, you could get to it quite easily, comfortably using craft. And, and even into modern time, the Macasey's um, Islands, there was still um, communication between Southeast Asia and Australia, particularly up in, in this region up here, still a lot of trade. Um, so you can see 50,000 years ago, by 45,000 years ago, they had gotten down into New South Wales. By 40,000 years ago, they'd actually had migrated and landed, um, not landed, but had arrived in Tasmania. Around about 10,000 years ago, the, there was climate change, sea levels rose, New Guinea got cut off, Tasmania got, got cut off, and we approach more and more what we know as the modern Australian coastline. So there's a rough, it gives you a rough idea of the pathway that was taken. So from, from, New, from New Guinea, groups moved up into New Guinea proper, and then two rough paths pretty much traced the coastline of Australia until they met up again down, uh, down about here in, in South Australia, modern day peninsula, Adelaide country, that kind of stuff, yeah? Excellent. Now, the reason why I show this map, because it's really, really important, and it really relates back to this whole concept of terra nullius that was used by the first Europeans, not sorry, not first Europeans, by the British when they arrived in Australia. So essentially terra nullius mean, quite literally means empty land. However, when Tyndale actually mapped out the language groups in Australia, this is what he found, that there were language groups in every single square kilometre of Australia. Now, when you look at modern um, settlement patterns, we pretty much hug the coast and we hug the east coast, yeah, really well, and small pockets over in the west coast. Um, um, so that's modern. Go back to pre-1788 and there were Australians in every single corner, ecological niche of Australia. And this map, as far as we can tell, was the map map of Australia from 10,000 years ago. Okay? So when the sea levels rose, um, that is pretty much that picture for the last 10,000 years. Um, and, and when the sea levels rose, um, obviously land here got cut off in, um, in, in the strait, yeah? Um, and all along the coast, okay? So up here in Sydney, up here, um, uh, even Apupu, Northern Territory, oh, sorry, Northern Territory and, and in Gulf Country. There are actually stories, oh, and in the Bight. There are actually stories which, which um, tell us of that time, of the, um, you know, the sea coming in and the, the disruption as people had to move away, their lands were being swallowed up. So for example, 50 kilometres 
uh, of coastline were disappearing in some areas of Australia. And it would have caused a great um, deal of, of, of angst for the local people because once upon a time they were living in, you know, living quite well in a particular area, but then they had to up sticks and actually move into land. Not only, not, and not move into empty land, so, so none of the land was empty actually. There was people everywhere. Um, th th these are essentially countries, yeah? So if you imagine, if you are down here and your country is all of a sudden flooded and now underwater, you've now got to migrate and become refugees in somebody else's land. And all of that is actually uh, documented in, in, in a number of cave paintings all around Australia where that actually happened. Fascinating stuff. There's a small snippets, snippets of that story are actually dealt with in First Footprints. So I highly recommend that you actually look at that, okay? So let's talk about this, um, referring back to Bill Gamage's book on the biggest estate on earth, okay? We can actually think of each one of these as, as not only just a country, but as an estate that family groups, um, related family groups, uh, live in these regions, okay? So each one of those colours, you can think of as a family group or as a language group. And what their job was to do, and this was actually hard baked into the dreaming and into the law, like the capital L-A-W, that that patch of land, you are spiritually and morally obligated to look after that land. You are intricately tied to that land. There is, there is virtually no separation between you and the land. And it's your job through penalty of death to look after your patch of the land. Not just look after your patch of land, but do so in collaboration with your neighbours. So Bill Gamage actually thinks of these, um, well, you can actually think of these, each one of these coloured blobs as estates. Now, what is an estate? So if we cast our minds back to um, Mother England, an estate would be um, a, like a plot of land which was actually managed by a family or a group and you'd have living, a living area over here and you might have some fresh water you know, as, as part of, of your package of land. You'd have manicured lawns over in one part. You'd have farm and, and animals. You, you would have wooded areas so that you can go hunting in, in other parts. But it's a big patch of land with multiple uses on that land. And what you would do if you lived in one of these is that you would migrate and you'd have do your little jobs over here on the farm and come over here, do your little jobs over here in the water and you know, you'd have to maintain the dam and so forth. Bill Gamage conceptualised that Australia was that on a continental scale, that the whole country was split up into these estates managed by related um, a, a, a people in family groups. So, so Bill Gamage's thesis is that e really each one of these is an estate, yeah? And, and managing all of this, making sure that people didn't, you know, um, strangle and, and kill each other, you needed a system of laws. And so that's where the dreaming and the law actually kicked in because it's more than just a whole bunch of myths that um, from, from long, long ago. Um, it's actually a system of interrelated knowledge which weaves together moral and also um, biological um, and, and a whole heap of other knowledge all woven together really quite intricately in, and it showed you how to be an Indigenous person. So, so this map is about, you know, was in existence for about, from about 35,000 years. And for you to be able to live peace, well, peacefully as you can for that time, you needed to have a common understanding amongst all these groups. One of those is, is that principle of caring for country. So everybody knew that it was their job to care for the country in their own little patch. So they became specialists uh, for looking after the ecosystems. So for example, if you are out in the desert, then you essentially became an expert ecologist in managing desert ecosystems. If you're on the coastline, 
then you would be experts in managing estuarine and coastal um, ecosystems. So essentially you became ecosystem managers and you had to understand how ecosystems work because that's how you manage the farm. The way that the law helped you actually care for country involved three key things. The primary tool for farming in Australia was firing. Now, not just some random fires, but, but really sophisticated use of fires so that you could actually, um, say, prepare um, country for, for, the, for the birth of kangaroos. Or you could prepare country to, to plan out a new um, patch of forest because you wanted timber in, say, 50 years' time. Or, for example, it, um, you, wanted, you, you were done with this year's harvest of daisy yam, so you would fire to clear the ground. Or, you would, uh, or, or, or lotuses out um, up, up, up in Kakadu. Um, the the, the um, lotuses were done, so you'd send fire out over the water. And so if you, can, you can imagine trying to burn out over the water, that would actually require some really sophisticated understanding of how water and fire interact, but it, it was actually still done. And a required part of being an Indigenous person, if, if you had swamps in your area. So there's a whole range of technologies that Indigenous people had to have to survive. How to use, so they had to have science in, er, in geology, how to use stones um, for buildings and fish farms and all the rest of it. Um, they built dams. There are famous uh, fish farms, eel farms. Um, there's dams and weirs all around the place, obviously all knocked down, but some still survive today. You had to be masters of, of wallaby behaviour, kangaroo behaviour, emu behaviour. How did you store and pass on that information? By dance. So males, before they used to go out on a kangaroo hunt, to um, to to pray to the pray to the gods, they would do the appropriate dance. But that dance was really about coordinating their hunting activities, reminding themselves of kangaroo behaviour, which would, for example, indicate when they knew a hunter was around. So there would be an ear flick or or a head turn or something like that. So the dance helped refresh their memory of how they're going to, going to attack the mob of, of kangaroos, but also the indicators of, of uh, kangaroo behaviour that in indicated they were spooked. So a whole bunch of Indigenous science that they had to understand, and all of this was encoded in dreaming stories, in the law. Okay? So along those lines, one of the, the, the really fascinating things that I found was that, that um, Indigenous Australians were probably the first bakers and the first farmers in the world. Now, we attribute, generally attribute that to somewhere in the Fertile Crescent about 10,000 years ago. Archaeological evidence tends to suggest that they've been farming bread and uh, wheat um, for at least 35,000 years ago. So over here is, a, is Tyndale's map of where wheat uh, was actually harvested, or grain, uh, was actually harvested in Australia. Um, so you can see that it stretches quite from over in Perth all the way up through Northern Territory, down through Queensland into Northern uh, New South Wales and also Victoria. So where it was dry within that arc, you'd actually go around outside of there. The carbohydrate of choice was the dam yazy, uh, yam daisy. Okay, so carbohydrate, super super important source. Um, uh, we, we need it as humans because it's our primary energy source. So the way the indigenous people solved that was relying primarily on two carbohydrate sources, primarily wheat within the grain belt and on the outside, yam daisy. And, um, and there are stories from the early settlements of Melbourne which describe these terrace gardens of these beautiful, beautiful lush soil uh, with just yam daisies which would um, and these fields of yam daisies, which will just go on for miles. Okay? Radio. So let's turn our attention now to one of the key pieces of technology that Indigenous people had, and that is around fire law. Okay? Now, even before humans arrived, 
there was already an established relationship between plants which had evolved adaptations towards fire. Fire has been a common part, an intricate part of Australian ecology for millions of years. And plants have actually evolved um, to the various fire regimes. Okay? So there was a number of adaptations in plants, in Australian plants in particular, which guard them against fire. Okay? So, or, or, or actually help encourage fire. So the oils in, in, in some uh, native Australian plants are actually there to encourage uh, fire. Um, so, so by encouraging fire, those plants are actually the ones who are actually able to quickly recover, kills off the competition, the, and they're, they're left to grow. Or they grow super tough bark. Um, or like the banksia, the seed pods only open in response to certain chemicals which are produced oh, from fire. Or you might have um, underground lignotubers that once a fire pass, you can just uh, you know, uh, uh, sprout immediately from that. So a whole heap of adaptations already in existence before humans actually ever set foot on the continent. Humans arrive and they actually enter into this partnership. They look at the plants. They observe over time and realise, oh, with this particular fire, this particular type of plant responds this way. So, for example, kangaroo grass. They would know that once a fire passed through, pretty much if there were rain, then you would get green new shoots fairly, fairly quickly, within something like two weeks. That is a key piece of information that you need to know if in your, in your estate, you, one of your totems was kangaroo, okay? Because to feed your kangaroo, you need kangaroo grass, so therefore you needed to understand that relationship and utilise that relationship that existed between kangaroo grass and fire. So there was an intricate connection between humans, plants and fire that the indigenous people understood and exploited to, uh, uh, to really ramp up and manage ecosystems. So the use of fire was so sophisticated, they were able to create landscapes such as these. Okay? So if you have a look at these, like just beautiful, beautiful landscapes. Um, and no wonder when the first explorers and, and people who came out on the first ships, such as Endeavour, when they looked out at the land, they, they, it reminded them of parks and, and these, uh, these, these stately estates back home in terms of open grassland and, and, and purposely placed trees and, and so forth. Okay? So, so it was quite common for settlers and explorers to describe these beautiful, beautiful um, countrysides. And all of it was because through expert use of fire. Okay? And, and so you can really think of uh, uh, Indigenous Australians as the first ecologists who manage their ecosystems with fire and in an expert way. And so you've got these open lands, so constant references to open lands. Um, when when the, the first um, uh, sheep farmers arrived, they would just send out the sheep and the sheep would actually just, you know, um, just keep walking and, and they would be able to smell off in a distance all these, these great pastures. Um, that just happened to be um, yam daisy farms of the local indigenous people and they weren't happy about that. Um, but just open fields, okay? Um, and, and actually, a, a lot of the bush that we see these days that, that we let grow because we think is natural, um, if you got an Indigenous person from back then and they saw that, they would actually be horrified because um, just bush just growing all willy-nilly without any intent or purpose from a human being is, is quite embarrassing. Um, so, yeah, so every part and parcel of land in Australia was actually managed and expertly managed at that. Okay? So for example, when we go up to Bunya, so this is a Bunya pine, it has that really characteristic shape. When you go up into the Bunya mountains and, and you go along you know, trails and things like that um, around the National Park, you'll, you'll come across these balds and, and these balds uh, are just open patches, um, just out in the middle of nowhere it seems, but they're actually quite strategically placed because if you stand in the middle of a bowl, you have these really commanding views. They're not there by accident. They're actually placed there because they either look at a place of significance or they look east or they look west 
or there is some kind of significance placed of, of where that board, just a patch of ground with, with grass and nothing is growing there. Now, um, and it was kind of a, a, a you know, a, a, a scientific question for people who saw these first, but they realized that actually they, they're not there by accident, they're not natural. Over years, what has been, what's happened is, is, is the local people, um, for years, you know, before pre-European settlements, before settlement, before um, fire bans and all the rest of it, um, they were actually purposely burnt and cleared and maintained because they were sites for meetings or corroborees or for men's business or for women's business or um, you, the, you know, um, important elders would meet there and they would discuss and, and look for signs in the stars or, or, or whatever. Okay? So, um, so, that was, so that was a phenomena which was actually solved only if you understand how indigenous people used, uh, used country and, and cared for country. Okay, so here is uh, the the bun the bunya, yeah, nut over here. Every three to four years, they come into fruit. So what would happen is is that neighbouring people, so from people of, as far no as North Queensland down in Victoria, they would either know or they'd actually be told, hey, it's time for the bunya festival. Now, if you were the local group up in bunya, it was your job to make sure that the country was ready to take all of these guests. Um, so as each group arrived, there would be assigned certain parts. Certain groups would actually have patches of forest where it was their responsibility to harvest and, and share food and, and come together. So it was a really, really important meeting site um, and it was actually quite known all throughout um, Australia and people from all over the continent would actually turn up. And if you haven't been there, it's quite a real, it's a stunning, stunning national park. So steeped in um, local history. Okay? So where we have grain, which is um, for the making of bread, and that was really important within, within the Tyndale wheat, uh, wheat belt that we saw earlier. Outside of that, where it was, where it was too wet, um, then da uh, the yam daisy was actually bought. So that's actually Peel ba uh, Bill Pasco. As you can see over there, he's actually holding up a yam daisy. And it was the carbohydrate of choice down in Victoria. So the picture that you can see down the bottom here is a hand-drawn picture of some ladies harvesting yam daisy. Um, really delicious. It's meant to taste, taste a little bit by carrot, but super, super nutritious. Um, so they farmed, yeah? So far from being just um, hunter uh, hunter-gatherers who would just, you know, haphazardly just stumble around randomly looking for food, eating bugs and, and leaves and stuff. Um, there was actually agriculture and they had fields and prepared the fields and they understood companion planting. And there's a whole complex system of knowledge required to actually do that. Not only was there um, horticulture and agriculture, but there's also animal husbandry. So, so this map here, um, this map is down in Conda. So the, that, that place up there, there's a photo. Here's a map of the actual entire fish farm. So once again, um, this was a really important meeting place. So for example, you'd have a festival for the bunya nut where you head up to the bunya nut and so you eat these nuts and carbohydrate and fat, fatten yourself up and, and head back home. Well, here's a really important protein source. And because of fish migrations now, so you either had fish or eels. Well, fish, eels are a type of fish. But um, they, uh, indigenous people built these traps all at certain points along rivers to actually, you know, take advantage. So what they would do is they would, they, they were actually fashioning, they were moving rocks, redirecting the river streams to form, um, uh, form ponds, of ch chains of ponds, for example, to store eels over time and, and uh, be able to close off uh, things and uh, uh, various sections and so, and so forth. So you've got the Burrwarrana fish traps. Um, so that's on the boundary of two indigenous groups. Obviously, they had to collaborate. But once again, in both these settings here, there would be fish festivals um, that... Related groups from all around Australia 
would know, oh, it's time for the fish festival. Um, they would solo, follow certain constellations. They would follow the song lines. They would walk and sing and pass through country, reaffirm connections, trade, trade um, you know, material goods and stories and information as they went along. Um, so here's an example of aquaculture. This is Gunjamari country down in um, Victoria. So, so this guy is one of the caretakers at the, 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 uh, the Conda fish map. Okay? Um, so Parramatta, if you follow the eels, um, Parramatta, the word Parramatta means quite literally the place of eels. Comes from the old name, Barramatta. Um, and, real, and, and, and so what you have is eels. So eels, they breed in fresh water, they head out to open ocean, do stuff there that scientists don't really understand, and somehow they make their way back. On their way back, humans, what they do is they step into the equation um, and actually take advantage of this massive pulse of protein moving from the open ocean onto land. So they would um, encourage and you know, um, look after the eels, they would take a portion of them and allow the rest to escape. And so that way, what they were doing was ramping up the ecosystem, providing um, habitat and food for these eels to get their numbers up. And so that way, they could take a portion of the, the eels out for, as their protein source, but still leave enough to maintain future harvests. So it was a really, really complex system and really fascinating. Okay? Um, here's another excellent example of, the, of, of how the stars were used for storytelling. So this is the constellation of the emu. So just like before, how the, in Polynesian culture, there was much less of a reliance on the join the dots kind of concept of astronomy and constellations. So very little constellation, but this would be considered a, con well, it's not really a constellation because it's a region of space which looks like an emu. So in the storytelling, at certain times of the year, the emu is laying down, and when it's laying down, that's when they're laying eggs, so you don't harvest. When, it's, when, they're st when the emu is standing up in an upright position, that means they're wandering around, therefore it, it is time to go and harvest. So it's a nice way of parents being able to remind children, hey, the eggs aren't ready, the, the emu is still laying down, okay? So, great um, equivalence between um, uh, sky and ground, okay? Radio, so one of the learning objectives is this one, explain the importance of indigenous technologies. Now, there are a number of technologies that I would like you to have a look at. So, fire management is definitely one of them. Fishing is definitely another. And animal husbandry, animal husbandry in, as in, how they look after, say, kangaroos or emus, okay? So it's no accident that we have place names like e emu plains and, and kangaroo plains. That's because once upon a time, they were somebody's emu farm that as part of their estate was probably one of their totems and they had to look after the emu so they can produce the eggs and the feather and the emu oils and all the rest of it use that to trade with neighbours and family, okay? So have a look at those technologies. And, and, uh, and what I'd like you to do is to tell me why they are important. So there's a whole bunch of technologies which were mentioned on an earlier slide. See if you can come up with why is it important for, for, um, to understand fire management? Why is it important? For, why is fishing important? Why is animal husbandry important? and so forth, okay? So refer back to that earlier slide. A lot of the knowledge which is contained, well, all of the knowledge which is contained in indigenous cultures is stored orally. Orally through, um, so not, not only orally, sorry, but also through dance, okay? So through dance, story, and song, all this information was, was stored. So here are some stories here that um, you'd actually tell kids yeah? So a lot of the stories that you probably see in um, libraries and, and kids' stories, they're, they're, they're stories that you tell kids. They're, they're not, you know, if you are an adult kangaroo hunter, like you rely on other information, just like we do uh, in modern time. But these are the kind of stories that um, are told to kids. 
to explain why this happened, why, um, how the echidna got its spines, why the kangaroo hops and so forth, um, why the moon behaves the way it does, why the Milky Way is the way that it is, okay? So on this slide is a bunch of uh, information that I would like you to have a look at, yeah? So here are the texts. So read these, but then come back here and summarise and see if you can draw out the key points, okay? Draw out the key points. So um, uh, the, the, the old people, yeah? Story from uh, Kuchin. So why, what are the key points for that? And what phenomena did it explain? Because at the end of the day, part of the role of science is explain why. Why, why is the sky blue? Um, uh, why, do, why, why does the um, sun and moon set and rise? Um, yeah, so a lot of it is why. So remember that explanatory power of theories? Well, this is almost the equivalent in, 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 in Australian Indigenous culture. These are, these are stories that we tell ourselves to explain why we observe things, okay? So there's a whole bunch of really, really cool stuff there that you can have a look at as well, okay? So just a reminder, we had a look at Polynesian science and how they got out into the Polynesian islands. And then we had a look more specifically at indigenous, Australian indigenous. Um, what I'd like you to particularly have a look at is describe the role of song, uh, song lines and astronomy. Um, there's some more astronomical. Um, oh, actually this whole thing is about astronomical information. So have a look at that as well. Um, and also in relation to the activity that we'll eventually do in the lab is look at the conception of Western and Indigenous seasons because really that's going to help us get to the heart of the differences in terms of epistemology and ontology between Western and Indigenous science, for want of a better word. Thank you.